All right, how's it going everyone? I'd like to welcome you to another lesson and today we are going to be talking about EQ, so equalization. And I think it's actually the most powerful plugin there is. You know, everyone wants to buy a new expensive plugin, but EQ is actually the most powerful plugin you can use and it's built in to your software. So if you have Logic or if you have GarageBand even, there's an EQ that is built in to your software that is very powerful. So first I just want to go over the basics. So when you're looking at the EQ window, you see here you have these kind of measurements, right? So you have 20, you know, on the, on the X axis you have 20 on the low end and you have 20K on the high end. So what that's referring to is frequency as measured in hertz. So you have on the very low end 20 hertz, which is the bottom end of human hearing. We're not able to discern pitches below 20 hertz. Um, so it makes sense that the graph would start here. We're also not able to discern pitches over 20,000 hertz or 20K. Um, that's an extremely high sound or high frequency. Other animals can hear above this range, but humans cannot. So this is our available spectrum of hearing, and that's what we're going to work with. You see on the y-axis, you have some other measurements. So you have zero in the center, and you have going up to 30 in the plus side, and you have going down to 30 on the minus side. And what that is referring to is amplitude as measured in decibels. So it's really just volume. It's a fancy way of saying that. Um, but it's the actual way to measure amplitude. So we can see that as well in our EQ. Now, in the logic EQ, we have... The, now, this is also... This is a graphic EQ because we're able to see... Uh, the shapes that we are creating and the shapes that we're going to use to affect our sounds. Now, Logic gives you some kind of pre-selected shapes that you can use, and they are the most common shapes. So uh, the, first, the first shape here is called, this would be called a high pass. Um, and so when you, when you select this and you bring it up, what it does is it starts to roll out all of the low frequency information in your sound. And I have a bunch of sounds that I've already kind of pre-selected and we're going to be doing this in real time so you can actually see and hear the effects that the EQ has. Um, but for right now, I'm just going to go over the basic layout of it. Um, so this would be called a high pass cut or a, a high, I guess a high pass cutoff or a high pass filter. Um, now for each of these kind of curves and shapes we have three parameters that we can adjust. So this first parameter you can see is measured in Hertz and that is referring to the frequency. So this is an accurate measurement of the exact frequency that you are placing this, this node on. Um, so it's, it's nice because if you know where you want to be at already, like a common practice would be to cut out all low frequency information below 80 hertz, let's say, because that would be what's considered sub frequencies. And if you're mixing a vocal, you don't really need any sub in your vocal, so you would commonly roll out all that low end. So if I know I want to take out 80 hertz, I can just type it right in, and there I am. Now, this uh, dB per octave refers to how severe the shape is going to be. So if I change it to 36 or 48, you can see that it's a sharper curve versus it goes all the way down to six, which is a much more gradual curve. And 
This just helps depending on the source material, what you're working with. Maybe a more gentle curve is better, but maybe you want to be more severe and you really want to make a strong cutoff at a specific point, so you would use a higher decibels per octave curve. Now, this other parameter down here refers to what is called the Q, and the Q is basically the same as a resonance control on a filter. Um, so that is also going to be how narrow or wide the band is that you're going to be adjusting. And this works on a scale from zero to one. So if I have it on one, it's going to be the most narrow band possible. So I can create this kind of a notch and I can sweep this across the entire frequency spectrum. Um, if I want it again to be more gradual, and actually this is letting me go to two, so I lied. Uh, let's go to zero, and you can see that I have a much wider curve. And this really, it, it doesn't apply as much in the, sh in the shelves. It applies more when we get to the bells, so I'm gonna work to that. So the next shape we have here is called a shelf, and that's designated by this icon here. So when I pull this up, you can see that it creates exactly that. It's kind of a shelf. So if you want to lift an entire a general area of frequencies, um, it's usually on a, a low or a high shelf, hence why it's on this side. So this would be the low shelf. So you can either do if you wanted to boost all your lows in a specific source, this is the way to do it. If you want to cut it, same way. So obviously if we're on the positive side of this zero, we are boosting and that means we are adding amplitude to the frequencies that we're selecting. If we go below the center line, that means we are cutting or we are taking away frequencies in our selection, okay? So the same parameters exist uh, on the shelf and you'll see they are consistent throughout. So next we have a bell shape and the bell is probably the most common EQ shape. You may have even seen the shape before. So as you pull it up, it creates this little kind of a bell shape. So the same thing, you have the frequency, you can choose exactly where you want to center your, your node. It should be the center of the bell. Um, the decibels is going to be exactly that. So it's the amount of amplitude going in the positive or negative. So you can either just click and drag it around or you can actually type it in once again. Now here's where we can really see the Q and how that works. So here, since at 0.6, it's more of a moderate curve. If I make it 0.1, you can see that now we have a huge range of frequencies that we can affect. Now, if I make it one even, or actually, let's pull it up as much as I can go. So the Q actually goes from zero to 100. So my mistake on that. But so the range being zero from 100, so if I go again to point 0.1, you can see it's basically like a mountain of frequencies. It's no longer a bell or a hill, it's a mountain. If I change it to 100, now it is a notch. Um, that's what we call this. And this is really useful if there are specific resonant frequencies in a source that you really just don't want. You can pinpoint them and pull them out or you may want to accentuate a very specific frequency and that's when you would use this notch parameter. So logic gives you four different bells to use in a single EQ, which is pretty useful for shaping most sounds. It also gives you this high shelf. Um, so you have, again, shelf for the high end. You can, you can boost or you can cut frequencies. Uh, in a larger range and a nice shelf because a lot of times we don't really want the very highs or the very lows in a frequency or in a, in a source. And then on the very 
the, the very last selection is going to be what we would call the low pass. And so that's obviously the opposite of the high pass. And as I pull this over, really it's allowing just the low frequencies to stay in. And so that's why we call it a low pass, because the low frequencies are allowed to pass through this filter that we're putting in. So that is the general overview. Um, most EQs that you're going to see are going to be in this format. Um, so if you can understand the basics in that way, um, you'll be pretty good to get started and making some choices with your EQing. Now, the other really amazing quality that some EQs have, and I would say again in 2019 most EQs should have this feature, is called the Frequency Analyzer. And so the Frequency Analyzer shows you, it, it physically, it, or it visibly shows you all of the harmonics that are making up your source sound. So this is very, very handy. Um, where you can actually s visibly see and zero in on frequencies that are either problem frequencies or things that you want to change and adjust. You can see it. In the past, you just had to use your ears and make adjustments on a hardware EQ. So just really just a box with knobs and you're just listening to the changes. And that is a different approach that has its own merits because you don't really want to be um, affected by what you're seeing. You do, at the end of the day, want to use your ears since we're working with sound, we're not working with visuals. So that's just a point on that. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and play some sounds and just start playing around with them and see how powerful the EQ is. So for the first selection, I just kind of have this uh, cycling pad uh, that is going to kind of come in and out in terms of volume. And so let's see, I'm actually just going to make a fresh EQ because I was just kind of playing with that one. So here's a new one and let's hear this sound and let's see what we can do to it. I'm going to pull up my analyzer so I can see it. Okay, so you can see that this sound is actually already pretty limited. It's really only happening in the low mids. It's going kind of between 100 and 500 hertz. Um, so that's centered in the low mids, but you can see the individual notes, the individual frequencies that are comprising this sound. So I don't really hear anything that I would need to do to this sound right now. What I can do is I could accentuate specific frequencies using that notch, uh, the notch bell that I was telling you about. So. Let's go ahead and try that. I'm going to focus on this node right here. Okay, so we can actually really hear this frequency now. So if I wanted more of this frequency for whatever reason, if it was just really pleasing to me or if it really kind of made, it brought more out of this sound and what it was trying to accomplish, I can do that really easy. Let's, let's target another one. So now I'm hearing this tone a lot more. Let's listen. See, so that actually helps in this situation because we weren't really hearing that before when it's just kind of cycling on its own. So personally, I like that. Let's, let's add another one and bring out another one of those top frequencies that are a little low.
okay? So see that? That actually really adds to this sound because we weren't really hearing these specific notes in this pad and now we are thanks to some really simple EQ choices. Okay, so that's the pad. Let's, let's move on. I have here just a uh, acoustic, an Apple loop, acoustic guitar loop. So let's check this out. Okay, so let's look at it, uh, frequency analyzer. So see so now we have basically the entire spectrum of sound here. So let's just play around with this. I'm gonna show you some basic stuff. Um, if I were to use this kind of low shelf, I can take out a ton of information and drastically change this sound. So let's try that. Now, so now we're really just hearing almost like the strings, right? We lost all the body of the guitar and we lost all the resonance that comes out of the sound hole. Um, and this is a technique too that you'll hear used a lot. Like maybe, maybe we've already gone through a couple, we've done a verse and a chorus in this song and we're gonna come back to the verse. Um, it's common to hear this kind of uh, filtered sound um, to, initiate the full sound. So if I let this play for a couple bars, like say in the middle of my song, and then all of a sudden I drop it open again, it's a much more dramatic effect, right? And it changes how the ear has been hearing this sound because we don't want to be habituated to any one sound for too long. We just get bored. It doesn't matter how complex the sound is or how unique it is. We want to always add variation and take the listener on a journey. So that's a common technique that's used. Now, let's see, with this recorded sound, I can also just highlight different aspects of it. So let's bring in some more top end here. So, and now you always want to, if you make an adjustment like that, you always want to take it out and listen to it before you made the change. So let's hear that. Okay, that's without it. It's with it. To me, this adds some fullness and some more richness in that top end. And maybe if I wanted the guitar to be more dominant in my mix or more forward, this is a good idea. Um, let's see what, what's going on in, in kind of the low, the lower area. So you can hear if I bring this up too much, it starts to get boomy and it starts to eat up the sonic space. So maybe that's not the route we want to go. Okay, again, there's some information here. You know, maybe there this is now a better sound than what I had. Let's just bypass it. That's without it, with it. Without it, with it. So to me, that just sounds better. Um, now, a lot of times when you have a source, even it, if it already sounds good or if it's recorded well, there are areas that you can just boost a little bit to really make it pop out of the speakers, you know, that just bring it, bring it to life. They give it more life and more action and activity and movement. And that's really what we want. We want sounds to be full and rich and three dimensional and that, you know, make you have an emotional reaction at the end of the day. It just needs to feel good. So I recommend just doing stuff like this, you know, just take loops, even an Apple loop. If you like, if you don't even have a microphone or anything to record an acoustic source in your house, or if even if you don't play an instrument, you can take these loops and stuff like that 
and start making choices in the EQ and listening in the headphones. And you can see the difference that it makes and how powerful of a tool it is. You know, this is just really basic stuff. A few changes here. I didn't make any changes over five decibels. So I always, I, I recommend that as well. Um, you can make, you know, there are no rules. You can be as dramatic as you want, but in general, if you're making changes that are, you know, up here, then that is a, a ton of resonance for this specific area. And uh, hopefully that's really benefiting your track. Otherwise, I don't really recommend making adjustments that are that severe unless you're working in an experimental <laughs> genre, which I do a lot of myself. But honestly, even then, sonically, it doesn't sound good coming out of speakers. At the end of the day, even if you're playing the weirdest stuff possible, it needs to sound great. It doesn't matter what you're doing sound needs to be balanced and it needs to sound great and cause an emotional reaction in the listener. So that's really what we're after with any of these tools and techniques and plugins and all that. We don't want to just use them because uh, it's fun to just do, and it is fun, but we want to make sure that we are actually headed somewhere with all of these adjustments that we're making. So uh, that's my rant on that. So, okay, so that's us kind of a, a acoustic guitar sound. So here is, uh, again, another Apple loop. This is just a basic uh, drum beat. So let's, let's listen to that. This is an entire drum set, so here we go. Okay, bring out my analyzer. Okay. Now drums are interesting because there are a bunch of separate instruments that come together to make one instrument, right? So in here, you can already kind of see, here's the bass drum, it's in this area. You can see that the snare is right around where we'd expect it to be. So almost every snare drum ends up right around 200 hertz. That's just where it is. I didn't make it up. I didn't uh, create that information, but this is where they end up. That's the sound that we like in a snare drum. Now, and then we have the cymbals over here, and you can see that this kind of mid area is fluctuating every time the snare is hit. So it's bringing up these mids every time we hear the snare. So let's go and just use some, uh, use some high and low pass filtering and let's try to highlight the individual areas of the drum set. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and sweep all this out and let's, let's see what it sounds like. Okay, so now, see we've almost lost the lows entirely. I mean, we essentially have, you can see that they're not really there anymore. We can still hear some aspects of the kick drum though, right? So you can see that a kick drum is not all low information. It actually has some mids and sometimes some high mids in it as well. We can still hear the click. We can hear the, the beater hitting the head. Let's keep going. Okay, so there again, we have that kind of filtered sound that we've heard a lot on the radio and in commercial recordings. Let's keep going. Okay, so you can see even here, we have a pretty severe shelf going to 2K. Now, we can still hear aspects of the snare. I can also still hear a very top end of the kick drum. So, this is important to do if you want to work with audio, if you want to get into mixing, if you want to produce your own music, your own tracks, even if it's electronic music, whatever you're working with, you want to hear the full frequency spectrum of your sources. So when you have a drum set, when you look at it, you may not think that the bass drum still has sonic information above 2K but it does. 
Okay, so let's keep keep moving on. So at this very dramatic point, we're at 6,300 hertz. We're really just reduced to hi hats and the very top end, like the papery sound of the snare. This is good information to know. Even though we haven't changed anything, we just learned a lot about the frequency spectrum of the individual components of the drum set. To me, that's cool. All right, let's get rid of this. Now I wanna show you something that you can do again with, let's use a notch. And let's say that I want a lot more information of this kick. Well, every source has a fundamental frequency. And if you search for it, in using your graphic display and your notch, eventually you will learn how to find this very quickly. So I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. So hear that? Now I'm hearing the note. I'm hearing a resonant note that's coming out of the bass drum. If I take this away, where is that? It's in there, but we're not hearing it. All of a sudden, it's almost like having a bass line, right? We're, we're taking out the note information that's hidden in this bass drum because every drum is tuned to a note. And that's another thing that we don't really think of all the time. We think of them as drums, you're just hitting them. And it's not really a tonal instrument like a keyboard, but there are notes Every drum is tuned to a fundamental note, and we can use these to augment or improve our mix. So let's say this drum track, you know, let's say it was in a mix and there were guitars or a piano and a singer. So there's gonna be a song that's gonna be in a key. Well, a lot of times, if you can take out that fundamental, uh, that fundamental note in the bass drum, Let's say that the song is in the key of D and I take a D and I accentuate that in the bass drum. All of a sudden, when you listen to this mix, it just feels better. And the reason is, is because that D is being reinforced. I'm giving you more of that D that you want. Okay, so that's my spiel there. Let's, uh, let's try something with a snare drum now. Okay. So this snare drum you can see is right in this 200 hertz area. Let's accentuate that a little bit. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is to really zero in just in this area. And so I think you can hear the body of the snare drum is just opening up. Now the snare is a lot fatter and it's taking up a lot more space in this drum recording. So let me take it out. And that's fine. You hear that? It's subtle, but again, if you want a bigger snare drum, you know, this is recorded well, the original recording. It's very flat and that's good. You don't have too much of any one thing. So that allows you to do this type of shaping. You know, maybe you want more of the snare drum. Maybe you want less. Maybe you want it to just sit back. It really depends on what else is going on in the song. And that's another point that I wanted to make. 
when you are doing this stuff, as you can see, it is a wormhole. It's very easy to start shaping and changing and be like, oh, if I do this and do that, we don't want to do, we don't want to lose the larger context of what we're doing. So when you are doing this individual shaping, let's say we are just zooming in on a snare drum, always EQ in the context of the entire track. You can make little changes like cleaning up uh, or you know bothersome frequencies, take those out on their own, but always play it back in context. So play the snare drum track with the entire drum mix and then play the drum mix in context with the song because it's very easy to get distracted in this wormhole of all these changes that you can make which might sound good alone but they don't sound good in context of the entire mix and once again that's the whole point okay let's do a couple more um, I have this other drum loop and I wanted to play this one because, all right, and let me just do something really quick. I'm going to take out any of the weird changes that I made on the first one. Part of using EQs is teaching you how to listen. And right away when I brought this loop in, I could tell that there was more mid-frequency information in this drum recording. So let's hear this. It's also a much more interesting drum piece. Okay, let's go back to our other beat. So I can just hear on initial listening that there's more mid information in this, in this in drum recording. So let's bring up our frequency analyzer. And you can see that there is more amplitude right in this area around the snare and the low mids. And that's what I was hearing. So again, let's just play with this and see what we can get out of it. So you can hear that the mids are the most dominant quality of this recording and it sounds fine but notice when I brought in a little bit of these highs with it without it so it kind of sounds dark So that's kind of a sweeping filter sound. I wouldn't use an EQ to do that, I would use a filter. But this is exactly what you wanna do. Just open up a sound and even just hear, just listen. To all the changes. Now, try taking frequencies out too and listen to that. See, now we hear a lot more of that kick. Take it out. So again, with that type of curve, that type of bell, I wouldn't really, I likely wouldn't use that in a mix, but I'm just showing you how you can hear these sources in an entirely different way. It starts to train your ear on how the frequency spectrum actually works. Okay, so I wanna just show you, let's just do one more example. So I brought in this hi-hat. And I'm going to loop it. 
Okay. So that sounds fine. Let's see what it looks like. Okay. As you would assume, it's just high frequency information. Now, I wanted to show you one other really cool thing that EQ can do. EQ can actually change the pitch of a source that you're hearing. So in more advanced DAWs like Ableton, it's really easy to just transpose the pitch of any sample. So you immediately go like, well, let's change this and get those pitches locked in so it's more consonant and it fits with my entire drum sound or it fits with my bass line. Well, you can do that with EQ as well and I'm gonna show you how. So yes, even the hi-hat has a pitch. This is a note. It's not just a white noise, cymbal, clangy metal sound. I'm gonna to start to sweep this up and we're gonna to listen to the pitch. Okay, what just happened right there? By taking out this mid information, all of a sudden the pitch started to go up. So the fundamental pitch of the hi-hat went up. So I can also do that the other direction, right? So if I wanna lower the pitch, I can take this top shelf. So let's try that. Hear that? So I didn't just take out top end information. I actually lowered the fundamental pitch of the entire sound itself. This is very cool. And this is something that I discovered just by doing exactly this, by playing around, listening, seeing what changes happen when I move things around. So don't be afraid to explore. Always explore, just keep your larger context in mind. And once again, you can't really go wrong. And if you do, you'll figure it out really quickly because it's just not gonna sound good. I wanna thank you for checking out this overview video on EQ. And I hope you learned something about EQ and how it works and how powerful of a tone shaping tool it is. If you like this video and you like these kind of tips in production and sound design, hit subscribe and follow this channel because I'm gonna keep making more and more videos in this realm. All right, I wanna thank you again and have a great day.